I thought that um, just to get things going, uh, before I start, uh, since I'm a professor, I would give you guys a, a pop quiz. Um, uh, nice thing is it doesn't get graded, right? So three questions about ENIAC, just to see sort of what you know before we start. Um, the uh, first question is how big was ENIAC? End to end, was ENIAC about as long, if you sort of put all the 40 panels next to each other, as a blue whale, a python, a minivan, or a school bus? Give you a second to think about what you think the answer is. And the answer is a blue whale, okay? So this is a simulation, a picture of a simulation of ENIAC done by Brian Stewart. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about this machine and wanna play with a real simulator, uh, this is, uh, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide to Brian's work and the proceedings of the IEEE. So um, this is the next place to go for more information, but you can park a school bus in that, but wrap it around and you get a blue whale. Okay, given that, how much memory did it have? 20 10-bit numbers, 1,000 16-bit numbers, or 10K or 100K of those? And the a completely amazing answer, it turns out, um, is, um, oops, uh, 10, uh, 20 10-bit numbers, okay? It had 20 accumulators. Each one would hold a 10-digit number, okay? So it was a decimal machine, and that was the only um, active memory it had. It had big function tables. Um, if you see Ginny's picture on your screen, as I do, you can see one of the function tables behind her. Um, but those were for, for fixed storage. They were the first ROMs as far as I can tell. Final question. The first program run on ENIAC was weather forecasting. I think I misspelled it. Uh, artillery shelf trajectories, Google's page rank algorithm or atomic bomb simulation. And the answer turns out to be, well, first, it turns out that the reason that John Walkley wanted a general purpose computer was for weather forecasting. But the first thing ever run on it was actually an atom bomb simulation, uh, quite remarkably. Okay, onward to our story. So I thought we'd look at this from the point of view of what one does now when one submits a research proposal to the government. So this is um, George Heilmeyer, who was director of DARPA back in the 70s, very famous, and by the way, um, a overseer of the, uh, of, the um, um, of, of SEAS, of our engineering school. Um, George came up with this set of questions that pretty much every research proposal to DARPA, and now increasingly everywhere needs to answer. So these are the questions, and I wanna look at essentially what Eckert and Walkley's answers would have been to these questions to give you a sense of what this machine was about. By the way, I'm going to talk about the first machine that they built. So the slides will stop just short of the move to stored program machines, but um, given Dave Patterson's comments, I'll say a word about it at that at the very end. Okay, so what are you trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? And the answer is that the army had a tremendous problem in World War II. It couldn't ship its new artillery. It was just sitting there unshippable because they couldn't compute the firing tables you needed to aim one of these guns, right? These firing tables are huge. There was one line and each of these firing tables is basically you fix an angle for the gun and then you compute the powder, you compute all kinds of things about it including corrections for wind speed. And, and these are very, very complicated. So um, Harry Reid actually back, uh, who's a historian of this machine um, way back when, these are essentially a set of equations that were used for doing the original firing tables for ENIAC. Um, there are three incremental equations to sort of track the movement of the shell um, in the X, Y, and Z coordinates. And you'll see if you look at the equations that they involve not only altitude and distance, but also the wind speed, both down the range and across the range. They involve how dense the air is and the temperature of the air, 
the humidity, all of which affect the relative speed of sound, which affects the flight of the shell. Um, the drag function was entirely empirical. It had to be hand computed and built into a large table. And finally, uh, the form factor of the shell itself plays a role in this. By the way, there were also more complicated terms for the spin of the, uh, of the shell itself, which affects precession. So all of this had to be computed for each line of that table. So how was it done? Well, originally, um, it was done by human computers, human, human calculators, who used mechanical um, calculators to get the job done, OK? So this is a picture not at Penn, uh, but at Dryden Flight Research Center of women computers. So all of these were mathematicians. The men were at war. Women were hired to do this work. And essentially, the way that they did it was one of two methods. For complicated things, you'd always have a adding machine, uh, which could also multiply and divide. Uh, Monroe and Marquand built the standard models sitting on your desk. And either you would do the entire process, which was done at Penn, for example, for these firing tables. I learned this from Kathy Kleiman of the uh, ENIAC Programmers Project about three weeks ago. Or as was done elsewhere, each woman would do a part of the calculation and then hand paper onto somebody else. You'd have a data flow in terms of architecture and what Andre is talking about this afternoon. You'd have a data flow of information going through the room. Okay. And I believe that when the ENIAC was built, what, um, what Mockley and Eckert were trying to do, given that Eckert had worked with a fellow by the name of Erwin Travers, who had tried to do this mechanically in the late 30s to do this data flow and failed, uh, he was trying to replicate that mechanism in electronics successfully. OK, now this is too slow, but there were these analog computers using turning wheels um, that essentially couldn't do arithmetic, but boy, could they do calculus, um, except that if the wheels slipped, you had big problems. Uh, and there was a thing called the differential analyzer invented at MIT. We had one in the basement of the Moore School. This is a picture from the Moore School. And this could do one line in 20 minutes. The Monroe machine and woman calculator, woman computer, took about 40 hours to do one line. So this is better, but it's still too slow to get the job done for the war. OK, so what's new to your approach? Next question. First, we got to say who you is. You was a large team of people, including some, some folks who built, designed parts of the machine whose, um, I see some of their, their children are here with us today. Um, and, um, but I'm going to focus on John Mockley and Press Eckert, who were the major proposers and designers of the machine. So this is a picture of the machine after it was finished. Uh, Press Eckert off to, off to the left, John Mockley off to the right. Uh, in the background is Gene Bartik, by the way, who's one of the two programmers who wrote the simulation program that was demonstrated today, 75 years ago, and is an extraordinarily brilliant person. Um, um, and by the way, was not invited to the dinner at the end of the, the day, just by the way. I think Jeannie will probably get back to this in her talk. Um, here's, um, here are close-up pictures. Um, so the machine is really due to John Mockley. John Mockley was a physicist teaching or scientist who had tremendous vision and wanted to build a general purpose machine. He understood in a way that almost nobody else did. Every other computer that existed, and I'll show you some later, mechanical slow ones, were to compute tables for mathematics. John understood that if you had a general purpose machine, you could use it for all kinds of things. His dream was to forecast the weather using a computer. He teamed up with a very young engineer who just turned 23 on the day the project started by the name of Press Eckert, um, a, uh, a faculty member at Penn some years ago, I believe it was Saul Pollock, for those of you who remember Saul, um, told me once that Press Eckert was the most brilliant electrical engineer he ever met. Um, so he was extraordinary. And um, he became the chief engineer 
because press saw how to do things that everybody else thought were impossible, but we'll get to in a minute. Okay, so what was new to their approach? They were gonna build a high speed, way high speed, fully electronic, that was a solution, uh, method of computation that by the way, even though the army wanted just artillery tables was completely general purpose. By the way, it was so general purpose looking ahead that once in fact, it became clear the stored program machine was the right thing to do. We now know that actually the first completed stored program machine was the ENIAC itself that had been microcoded with its instruction set to simulate um, actually um, to simulate uh, a stored program computer um, that was gotten was finished uh, down at Aberdeen around 47 but um, uh, but in fact, the seeds of it were already happening at the Moore School, as Dave said. Okay, so what was new? What was new was that the Moore Monroe machines would be replaced by electronic accumulators, each one of which could do 5,000 ads per second, wildly faster than anything that existed before. And what was going to happen is again, as in this other way of computing with human computers where partial results were fed across the room, these accumulators would actually each computer result and then send it on to some other accumulators. So this is a very different design. It's a data flow design. The design roughly, it's a, where essentially a machine is told, a bunch of accumulators are told, do your thing. One receives a number, one sends a number. It's added or subtracted depending upon how the transmission is done. Okay, and then when that's done, one of those machines sends a pulse to the next step in the computation saying your turn next, and then it moves on and on and on. Okay, so this is a, this is a different paradigm. And the program, it's, it's basically programmed by linking these triggering cables and by setting um, these little knobs here, each of which is one line of code. So essentially um, um, what's going on here, if you look at the little switch called five, you see it has a bunch of symbols on it. It's actually tied to the switch below, which is a simple repeat. So you could hardwire in for this thing to say, do an add and do it five times or six times to say here. Um, here's what the knobs actually look like. So what you see is what the machine could do is either receive a number on one of five different data buses, alpha through epsilon, it could, or it could um, read in a number, um, it could send a number um, positive, it could send the, the nines complement of that for a subtraction, or it could do nothing. The do nothing operation turned out to be very valuable. Uh, the C switch above allows it to simply be a constant transmitter for one, which is very useful. And each one of these is one line of code. There would be a, a two lines down at the bottom of the machine. You can see it here at the bottom for each one of those lines of code. This would be the pulse for it to start. And when it was done, it would send a pulse out to here to stop. And then you wired the whole machine together in a very complicated way to build the program. So, um, so this is a picture from Aberdeen uh, later, and this is the setup of the machine. So the bottom cables are the initiation and triggering cables, and the top cables are running back and forth across the data buses. Okay, so why do they think it would work? Well, um, because all of the individual pieces had been tried somewhere else. They were gonna bring it together with a, a new secret sauce. So the first thing that had been tried is we knew that you could do general purpose computing. Um, starting with relay computers built at Bell Labs, IBM um, working with Harvard um, had actually designed under Aiken, whose vision this was, built um, a, a well under design when, when these guys started here, but finished in 44, a machine that used electromechanical relays to actually generate math tables. They could do three ads a second, six seconds per multiply, not fast. Uh, it didn't have an if statement, it was data insensitive. 
Um, it used a, a, a punch tape for program. You could do loops if you took the paper tape and glued it into a loop. Uh, that worked real well. Um, um, and, um, and it worked quite well. Grace Hopper got her start on, on this machine. So they knew that existed. Mockley had an experience in a few years before this started that convinced him that a high-speed electronic machine ought to be possible. What he saw was almost a computer built by a guy by the name of Nassau in Iowa. Okay, it was completed in 1942, although it didn't quite work, but it was, there were some mechanical problems. Um, and what Atenasaf had the, the, the insight to see that electronics should be able to compute what he didn't realize is that they were general purpose and that they could be fast. So there were aspects of this machine that tied it down to only 30 ads a second, and there was no way around that. And it did one part of solving a set of linear equations, hardwired. What it did is did one variable elimination per turn, then you got an output, fed it back in, hand ran the thing again. Um, but when Morkley saw this machine, uh, he knew this ought to be possible. Okay, years ago when I was really looking at this, uh, if you look at the circus, he probably brought it back. Eckert took one look at it, slapped his head off it at the circuits could not run fast and said, uh, let's try something else. But this gave insight that this was doable. Now what Eckert did know about is high speed counters that were being done at RCA labs nearby. So by 43, they had a running machine electronic counter for radar work and other things that could run at 10 to the fifth counts a second. And they were already well under their way to have a 10 to the sixth count a second machine. And Eckert knew that if this was doable, his machine ought to be doable, okay? There were a bunch of things they didn't know about, by the way. So Zusa had, in Germany, had designed this amazing mechanical machine. It was quite slow in the 30s, but it had full floating point arithmetic and binary. Brilliant machine but nobody knew about it. And finally, there was the Colossus machine. This is a special purpose code breaking computer built a little earlier than this in Britain. It ran at 5,000 characters of input per second. That's the only number I can find, it's code breaking. This question is how fast it reads. So it's very fast. Program with switches and plug boards. Um, but it was special purpose, not general purpose, and nobody knew about it until the 70s. So once again, the, the Brits independently invented packet switching at about the same time that it was invented here. But again, it, nobody knew about it. It was top secret. Okay, so what difference does it make? Well, it turns out this ought to speed up the firing tables by about 7,000 times, right? Instead of a human computer with a Monroe taking 40 hours or the differential analyzer taking 20 minutes to generate one firing table line, the ENIAC could do it in 20 seconds, right? Flight time for a reasonable artillery shell is about 25, 30 seconds. So it could actually compute faster than the shell could fly. This was amazing 75 years ago when they demonstrated this. What are the risks? Well, real simple. The best experts in the world the people who at IBM um, and at Harvard who done the Mark I, the Mark II, and so on, and the differential analyzer people said it won't work. You cannot build something with this many tubes and have them all run. It's too complicated. It can't be done. Turns out that the machine itself actually had 18,000 tubes. Okay, oh, this is a picture of Betty Holberton over here, who's the other programmer of that first um, um, of that first um, machine. She 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 edited. Uh, Betty Holberton went on to do many amazing things. Actually, as did many of the programmers. Uh, and again, you can see how complicated the setup is. I don't know who the guy in the background is. Um, here are the four panels we have from the back, and this is just four out of forty. Okay, now if you don't know about tubes, a tube is a small light bulb with a filament in it that can be used to amplify signals roughly, okay? Um, the other way to think of it is think of it as a MOSFET with a, um, uh, with a little fuse attached that's gonna burn out with time that heats the thing up just for fun. Okay, well, Eckert's solution 
was to use a trick that was known from the late 30s for electronic organs. So here's an amazing device. It actually turns out to be the first polysonic uh, synthesizer, just by the way, um, that had 163 tubes in it and that worked fine. And the trick was you run the filaments at about half power. So you just keep the thing running just hot enough to boil off electrons. And that should make these things really much more stable. And it did. As long as you didn't turn the ENIAC on and off, big mistake they made at Aberdeen at first, okay, it would run for quite a long time. By, by which, by the way, I mean days, not, not years. But, but the machine was also designed to be a modular, so you could pull out a module that failed and debug it offline. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, um, and Eckert understood that something of this magnitude could actually be designed and made to work and was correct. So just to go through a few more of the Halmeyer catechism questions, uh, how much did it cost? $500,000 in those days. How long would it take? About three years, right? What were the midterm and final exams? Well, by July of 44, they had built two accumulators and were able to do simple arithmetic with the two of them. And once that worked, it was clear the rest of the machine would work. Now, there were some very tricky other parts to do. Um, there was a multiplier and divider and square rooter. Um, that was um, really quite a tricky design. In fact, when von Neumann saw the first circuits, he thought it was a short circuit and wouldn't work. He didn't actually understand electronics exactly and resistances. Um, uh, there are many complicated other things to do. Um, there's a whole printer and reader that um, I believe Harry Husky did um, that, um, um, that were, so there were lots and lots of things that had to be done after this, but this meant it was going to work. And then finally, of course, there was a demonstration of the machine uh, that was done today in 1946, uh, where a, uh, a crowd was brought in. It was announced the night before, and then a crowd was brought in. The machine, which had been running since November, actually, um, um, but it was made not, it had been top secret up to this point. Um, and a crowd was brought in, and they were shown the machine, and it was made public. That was great. It, basically, there was a program um, that actually simulated a trajectory of a artillery shell, and they watched the they they watched the flashing lights on the accumulate on one accumulator show the height of the shell go up and then come down and showed what the range was. So that's almost the story. Um, couple comments. One is that amazingly, the programmers who actually did all this weren't invited to the celebration, okay? So, um, um, so uh, Gini Calzerano is going to talk about this, uh, I hope, next. Uh, here are four of the programmers alive in 1995. Kathy Clayman, who um, has played a major role in, in bringing their story to light, uh, runs a project called the ENIAC Programmers Project, which has done a phenomenal documentary on this. And you can see a trailer for this online, which I strongly recommend. Um, and let me just say that uh, I had, uh, had the, uh, uh, the honor really of spending a bunch of time talking to Betty Holberton, uh, Kay Antonelli, uh, Kay Mockley Antonelli, uh, and, and Jean Bartik. And these are three of the smartest people I've ever talked to, just by the way. Um, so, um, uh, that really brings us to the end, but the I just want to tie back briefly to the next step. Um, what happened is while this was going on, every Monday, the machine was being built. I, I have Mockley's notebooks from two years before it was done. He was off designing Mercury delay lines. He was off designing stored program machines. John von Neumann would stop every Monday. They'd talk, and then von Neumann actually one summer uh, went off. I heard this from Herman Goldstein, who was the mathematician who convinced the army to fund this. So this is directly from Goldstein, right, who thought I wanted to know about that piece of things. That wasn't why I stopped by that day. But it turns out von Neumann went off to New England for the summer, wrote a set of mathematical letters to Goldstein. Goldstein, he tells me, edited them together into a, into a con coherent paper and published it uh, under only von Neumann's name, without including Mockley or 
um, or Eckert, and then classified it secret and sent it to 200 of his best friends, okay? So uh, just, um, and then once the machine got down to Aberdeen, it was clear that for more complicated things, the first thing went on the stored program machine there, we now know due to new research, be beating out the Manchester machine by a few weeks was actually a hydrogen bomb simulation. It was one of two simulations run on the machine. The first we have the code for, it didn't work. The second one is still top secret, it worked. So um, that's the end of my story, thanks. I don't know if there's time for questions. Thanks, Mitch. I think we have time for a couple questions. Uh, so one of the questions came up, you kind of touched on the reliability issue a little bit more on a component level, but what about the wires? Could you talk about how the wires that were actually used to connect the different uh, circuits uh, were and how, how the, uh, the programs were actually then debugged? Yeah, um, so the wires, the cables were big. Um, you know, essentially um, at every step of the way, Eckert knew that he was pushing the edge of things and over-designed, over-designed in some amazing ways, right? Um, and um, so the cables were huge, so they were reliable, okay? I never heard any story about a cable failing. Debugging, um, uh, the machine actually had two great properties. Uh, it had a single step mode. So if you um, look, if you actually look at the panel behind Paul, which you can't quite see, there's actually a little socket to plug in a button on a long cord that you could walk around and single step the machine. Um, anybody who's done assembly language programming, I cut my tooth on PDP-8, so it turns out it's a great thing to have. But it also had tw 20 microcycles per add, per instruction, and you could step it through the 20 microcycles. So to debug the hardware itself, you could actually do that. And that turned out to be tremendously useful. And, and Mitch, maybe one more question to answer here. Uh, and then there's some more that are gonna be in the question and answer session. So hopefully after uh, you're done and when, when Jeannie's talking, you can answer a few more. Um, but this comes to an education point of view. Basically the question is, most people don't understand computer architecture and how computers are designed, built to the level that you do and everyone else uh, of our speakers. Uh, do you think this is a bad thing? And if so, how do you think we should change it? Um, um, let's see. Um, I happen to know how our television set works. I know my mother doesn't. She watches television very successfully every day. Okay. Um, so, so do users need to understand that? Uh, no, right? Computer scientists? Um, there are a couple different views on this. Um, there's a view uh, that uh, Yale Pat is famous for, for example, that says you should understand the machine at every level down to almost how the MOSFET works, okay? I happen to subscribe to that school, okay? Uh, my oldest son, who's now in his middle 40s, who's a very successful um, um, software architect uh, and designers, believes that any level of abstraction is fine. You just pick that and understand it on up and you lose epsilon below, but that's okay. So um, I actually think that, um, um, that understanding how our tools work underneath gives us more insight into them. So, um, you know, um, um, I, I'm just, I also will admit I'm, I'm, I'm um, terminally curious. And so I couldn't get by without, um, right. Well, thank you, Mitch, for that great talk. And uh, Paul, I'm going to hand it back to you. But Mitch, if you could, there's some very, there's a nice discussion going on in the question and answers that I think you'd like to get involved in. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot, James. Thanks, Mitch.